All right, here we are, our uh, last uh, class in this series entitled Understanding and Obeying the uh, Ten Commandments. We're going to do commandment number 10. This is lesson 12 of that series. And the title of this lesson is The Desire for What is Forbidden. So uh, the best source of good deeds are good desires. And so the 10th commandment deals with man's desires and how they determine the type of life he will experience. So let's read commandment number 10, that's in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. The commandment states, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, the word covet, the word covet means enthusiastic desire and by itself is neither good nor bad. Our enthusiastic desire becomes the sin of coveting when we desire something or someone that is not permitted or something uh, that is gained unjustly. For example, David, the psalmist and king of Israel, who desired a woman not permitted him because she was married to someone else. Uh, of course, it's okay to desire a woman, but not if you're married or if that woman you know, is married to someone else. Uh, so we see that David did not control uh, this desire and it led him to adultery and murder and deception of the nation and uh, terrible, terrible uh, consequences uh, afterwards. Uh, of course, his first sin was not adultery. This was his second sin. Now, his first sin was covetousness, the desire for something or someone that is forbidden. And in his case, uh, his desire for Uriah's uh, wife. And so the core of evil in the sin of covetousness is selfishness. Uh, this is what separates a normal and healthy desire for something from the sin of coveting. Let's read uh, Psalm, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Proverbs rather, uh, 21, uh, verse 25 and 26. The, uh, the writer says, the desire of the sluggard puts him to death for his hands refuse to work. All day long he is craving while the righteous gives and does not hold back. And here, the writer describes the opposite virtue of covetousness, which is generosity. You know, when he says, and the righteous gives and does not hold back. So empty desire, uh, the bottomless yearning of the lazy, the, the selfish desire of the immature. These are the elements that create coveting. Uh, a covet, uh, covetous person desires to gain without effort or to gain merely to spend on self without any thought of serving others or glorifying God. For example, the person who covets your success usually wants it for free and for his own gratification only. Now, remember, God forbids things because they are destructive to us. Covetousness is especially destructive for several reasons. First of all, it destroys our relationship with other people. Um, individually. Uh, as individuals, we suffer when we covet because coveting leads us to judge everything in life from the perspective of how it will affect us or how it will benefit us only. Uh, covetous people ask, uh, always ask the same questions uh, when they're considering something or when they desire something. How will it profit me? Or how will this give me enjoyment? Or how can I make this last for myself? Instead of asking the important questions like, how will this affect other people? Or how will this build up those that I love? Or how will this serve God? This egocentric thinking creates isolation because it blinds a person to the needs of other people. And it leads an individual to lose human contact, which in turn develops into uh, loneliness and depression, disorientation, and eventually into despair. Covetousness also affects us collectively. Uh, greedy people as a group uh, engender hatred for themselves. You know, individuals or nations 
who because of their unconscious covetousness amass supplies of essential products to artificially keep prices high and cause hardship on other groups, they create a hatred and, and strife in society, in the world. This is one reason there are famines and wars and strikes and, and, and social uh, unrest. If there were less covetousness among nations and true generosity, there would be less hatred and consequently less war and less death. Aside from alienating us from others individually and collectively, uh, covetousness also destroys our relationship with God. You know, God tells man in his word that if man keeps God as his first priority in life, man will have peace and salvation. And Jesus talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters five and six. When we sin through covetousness, we replace God with our own desires. Our own desires become our priority. This is why Paul refers to covetousness as idolatry in Ephesians chapter five, verse five, and in Colossians chapter three, verse five. Why idolatry? Because we've removed God as our first priority and we've made our personal desires and the gratification of those desires as our first priority. In other words, our desires become our God and thus become idolatry. When our desire for things whether they are forbidden or simply selfish, when our desire for things replaces our desire to God and to others, we lose the reward of joy and satisfaction that comes from serving the Lord with our time and our goods and our money. Those who do not make the Lord and His service a priority begin a vicious downward cycle. The less they serve, the less they give. The less they serve and give, the less they rejoice. The less they rejoice and receive from God, the less they believe. And the less they believe, well, the less they serve and give and the cycle goes onward and onward. You know you're in this cycle because you do more complaining than rejoicing. You do more doubting and depression than service. Uh, more of the world and its activities than the kingdom and its influence. In the end, we don't know what we want. We just want, but we're never satisfied. This is the end result of covetousness, empty materialism. Now, how do we obey this command? The command is stated in a negative form, but there are positive ways to honor it and to avoid the trap of covetousness. For example, we need to trust in God for everything. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, Jesus says, do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. In other words, don't just trust in God, but trust that God Himself both knows what you really need in every area of your life and He is able to provide it. Trust that God knows your needs and will fulfill them in His way and in His time. Secondly, keep your priorities straight. So important, keep your priorities straight. In the same um, passage in Matthew 6, uh, verse 33, Jesus continues and says, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. See, our job in this world as Christians every day is to understand how we are to serve God and His kingdom first with our talents and with our time. God promises that when this is our first priority, He Himself will provide what we need, whether it's materially or emotionally or spiritually, all these things that we need to live in this world, He will provide them if we focus on putting Him first in our lives. When we turn this around and we try to serve our needs first instead of our God, we're never satisfied. Why? Well, we never seem to acquire enough to satisfy our desire for more. Now, the reason for this is that the feeling of satisfaction that we crave is actually a gift 
given to us freely by God when we seek Him first and not the result of amassing wealth or amassing goods. Uh, the, the writer of uh, Ecclesiastes says it much when he says, I know that there is nothing better for them, meaning men, uh, mankind, uh, than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. This is why satisfaction in life comes from keeping God and His service first, and this satisfaction and contentment protects us from the trap and the cycle of covetousness. You know, in covetousness, we're always seeking you know, to feel satisfied, to feel that, 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 that idea of safety and satisfaction. We think that amassing more or getting more of whatever it is, is going to do that. When in reality, the feeling of satisfaction is a gift given to us by God when we make Him a, uh, a priority. And then thirdly, how do, we, you know, how do we obey this command? Trust in God for everything, maintain our priorities. Number three, be content today. Be content today. Two passages of scripture. First one, 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, uh, Paul says, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. And then in another passage in Hebrews 13.5 and 6, the writer says, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man uh, do to me? So learn to be full with today's blessings. Now this doesn't condone laziness, it doesn't glorify poverty. There's no nobility in poverty. Uh, a person can strive to improve, to succeed, but in order to avoid the trap of covetousness, that same person must also learn to be satisfied where he finds himself today. You know, some people will only be happy and satisfied in the future. When this happens, when I finish this, then I'll be happy. And then, well, I'll finish college. Then I'll really feel sad. No, and then when we're finally married. Well, when we finally own our own home and it never, it ever ends. They're always happy, but only in the future, no matter what they have today. Well, when you think like this, this guarantees that you'll never be happy. If you can't be happy today with what you have, you'll never be able to be happy with what you have tomorrow. I can be content today because I know that this is what God has provided today and I trust that He'll provide for tomorrow. Not to be thankful, to have endless desire is to reject what God has provided in exchange for what we, for what we covet. And so coveting is the uncontrolled desire for forbidden things or the uncontrolled desire to acquire, you know, what we call greed. This sin is dangerous because it separates us and it isolates us from others. This is why greedy people usually are lonely people. And it makes us servants of our needs and desires instead of servants of God. We can avoid this sin by remembering, one, trust God to provide what you need. Two, keep God first in service, not needs. And three, thank God for what you have now. Not what you're going to have tomorrow. Thank Him and learn to be thankful for what you have, whatever that is, great or small, today. You know, as, Christian, this, uh, as Christians, this sin is truly, uh, it's a foolish one because God takes care of all of our earthly needs so we can pursue our relationship with Him in peace. And He gives us freely the two things that no effort on earth could ever buy, and that is forgiveness and eternal life in Jesus Christ. So if we keep our hearts fixed on these treasures, uh, there can never be anything in this world that can draw us away from the love of God that, are, that is in um, uh, Christ Jesus uh, our Lord. Well, that's the end of our very short and compressed series on the Ten uh, Commandments. I uh, thank you for participating 
in this small group study. And uh, if you wait just a moment, I'll be giving you the questions that you can use in your small group discussion. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Question number one. As a child, what thing do you remember wanting the most? Question number two. As an adult, what thing or situation do you desire more than any other? Question number three. Why do you think your desire has not yet been fulfilled? Question number four. Who do you think is most responsible for getting what you want? Why? Question number five. Can you picture yourself not desiring anything? What does this picture look like?